Well, I mean, that's why it's sports, man. Anything can happen. Yeah, and that's just a classic answer. You know, if my grandma had wheels, she'd be a bike. So, <laughs> I like that. I like that one more than Major yeah. than Mike. It's sportsman. <laughs> <laughs> Can I use that tomorrow? Hey, man, it's like, well, I like that, and then you can get it even more ridiculous, and you're like, yeah, and if my fucking aunt had, or sorry, what if my uncle had tits, he'd beat my aunt, you know? It's fucking... <laughs> I like that. Getting all sorts of silly white people shit like that. It's just another day. It's just another day. It's just another day. This is the the second half of the first ever Just Another Day draft. And this is Just Another Day with... David. Adam. Elliot. I guess that, like, those don't, like, that should be a genre at some... Or do you consider stoner movies a genre? Or is it just a given that they're all comedies? Stoner movies are just a... Is, is a it's like a sub-genre of comedy. Yeah. You're never gonna you're never like, gonna get like, like how a, rom com's a thing, they're stoner com. Kinda, yeah, absolutely. Kinda, yeah. Yeah. It's just usually not done very well at all. Like it's right. usually just full of really stupid fucking movies. Or and then they have the the standard college movie that makes the stoner like a guy that's like Wah. looks like Kaiser and just walks around and is like Wah. Pretty much. Like, what? That's not. That's literally most. Most of them look like your school teachers. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Four year old pretty dad much. just choking up. Well, that's the thing. They have to make it funny, as I do air quotes when I say that. They gotta have the exact idea Aim of what up. people picture. I don't but know. Not. Well, I guess would would you consider? Uh... Now, actually, I, I'm not gonna. But the two. Mo- well, actually, this one is like dazed and confused is one that comes to mind. Where I'm like, that's kind of a, a older. Stoner I, comedy. That's like I, one of the first of the bunch. I'd yeah. say so, yeah. That's got that feel. I was going to bring up Fast Times, but I. that's not... I don't think that's really a stoner movie. No. That's just kind no, of an I overall think... funny movie that yeah. happens to have a little weed in it. Is Big Lebowski yeah. a, a pot comedy? No, it's more of a white Russian comedy. That's what I'm yeah. I don't... It's got its the own only new Russian genre of white Russian. It's in America, baby. No. Yeah. <laughs> No, the Russian import there. No, that is like a weird thing. Like I, I I like I started thinking about that. I was like, I don't really think there's any like another weak comedy. I guess would be the Friday movies. Oh like, yeah, kind of no, dictated true. around yeah. weed. Especially I guess the, the first, first two. One. And then well, that's know. well, that's the thing too. They just get weird. Like weed's always involved, and it's always a a part a of sub-plot. it. It always plays a role. The first one was probably the most important one for it, though, where he just smokes that last bit of <laughs> Big Worm's fucking weed, and now all of a sudden he's out to fucking kill him. He's like, Big Perm, Big Snake, Big, I don't give a damn. Yeah. <laughs> I don't give a damn, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. And I, w- I wish that they could have patched that shit up, and he was in another one of those movies. That would have been funny as fuck. I, I... But, then, but then again, like if, you had, if, if you're in that position... Or sorry, you're in the position we are now, and you're casting a Friday movie. You could only have Smokey or Day Day. Who are you gonna pick? Because I'd probably pick Day Day. I really like Mike Epps. Yeah, Mike Epps is hilarious. I, I think I think the issue with Smokey is it's not really like at the end of the movie, his character is still a piece of shit and like not not as funny. Like most of the funny shits happens to him in the first Friday. It's not like Mike Epps where Mike Epps is the funny one. I don't want to do that, man. Like acting like a little bitch. <laughs> yeah. It was like it's just so funny. It was like, "Where's security, Craig?" <laughs> Top flight security. <laughs> <laughs> Top flight security of the world, Craig. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like that shit cracks me up because, like, just the way Mike Epps plays it is just a big ass goofball. Like, well, that and he has the greatest quips. Like when they go into the little guard shack and Ice Cube's like, "Man, it's small," and he's like, "No, you big in here." I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> Pulls him I, down like, to sell in the milk crate. Calm down. Yeah. <laughs> Like fuck, man! Like it's it's so it's, funny. it's incredible that and Cat Williams having like one of his first big roles in that too, and just and of all people, Cat Williams versus Terry Crews I in know. a fucking fucking rape battle, like Jesus Christ, that was incredible. And Terry Crews just playing a fucking gay man coming out of jail. That shit. 
Damon was one of the, is one of the greatest fucking characters ever and, written. It's and that's when he was funny. like normal human size. Like he's he's fit. Like he's normal fit. Not like now where his muscles are, have muscles. I don't know? know, man. He was pretty intimidating in that shit too. Like he wasn't just like some dude with a little muscle on him. No, no, he was no, still no. pretty yoked up. Yeah. I mean, but now he's a behemoth. You know what I mean? Like he may not be like probably one of the strongest people in the world, but I think he is definitely one of the like in most in control of his muscles people in the world who knows how to activate that shit like crazy. I mean, he does some really cool workouts and shit. Like he's not even just doing regular shit. Like he does plyometrics with heavy weight. Like it's just, it's just, it's just on a whole different level. He's not like going to do a squat. He's going to do a squat and then hit it with a big ass jump. He literally, if you remember the episode of my wife and kids when he's doing Euro training and shit, and it's just the most absurd shit. That's literally yeah. what he's doing in the gym. It's crazy. It's fucked up, man. I just don't think it's I, awesome. I don't think I can ever get those. Up. But no, nah, that's why I was just talking about those genres, just because we watched that movie over the weekend. It just like it dawned on me. I was like, man, I don't think I, I literally don't think there's been, well, even comedies. Like I don't think there's been a, a like a comedy that I've ever had to go see in the theaters in a while. Like the last movie that was one that was like world sensational was like, I don't know, maybe like The Hangover. Like you know what I mean? It was like that long ago. Or that shit came out in like 2008 or 2009, didn't it? Yeah, but like think about it. like Step Brothers is when we all had to see old school before that. Like, well, old school was like old. Old what was that like? Probably like 2004, 2005 or yeah. some shit. Yeah, yeah maybe even earlier. Yeah. Oh, so that's that, that's I mean. a fucking that's an old old one. Like I thought about that yeah. the other day. I was like, when when was the last comedy that like went came to theaters that it was like, oh fuck, we have to go see this because this movie's hysterical. Like, I don't think there's been one in a while. Like Talladega Nights and all that jazz. Like. The, out of all that shit you said, which is all mostly just like the high school era, mm-hmm. I th- think Pineapple Express is probably the latest of those of those ones that you mentioned. Because Talladega Nights, I know I'm almost certain that was 2006. Damn, that, that was, sounds that was, about right. I'm pretty sure that was freshman year. Because yeah, it was like literally middle of freshman year, I think. Because I remember everybody fucking talking about that movie. Is Me comedy included. dead? Is that what I'm learning? No, I think you're just confused. Yeah, it's just... To be honest, I think you just have your timelines mixed up right now. Well, also, well, no, if you I... think about it, the last two years, nothing has been in theaters. I get that. No, I just mean like... like and everything much... goes digital very quickly anyways, so... Yeah. I'm going to say, how much stuff are you it's... watching on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon? There's got to be... I mean, honestly, you could probably go through the list and see what's been released just on those. You'll probably find a solid movie that you definitely enjoy. And oh, I know, but I mean one, one that's just as been, been as sensational as, like... Like, I remember literally when those movies, like, I guess in high school and stuff came out, like, we all were like, we're going to the theater to see this, or, you know what I mean? Like, we just... <clears throat> we had to see it, like, super bad, and, like, all... Like, that jazz back in the day. Like, when we saw those, like, it was like, oh, bro you need to see this ASAP. Like, I don't think there's been, like, a comedy I've released in the past, like, five years that has just been, like, you need to see this type comedy. Like, what? Like, maybe, like, 21 Jump Street? Was that, like, the last, like, you know, it's... I don't even know when that came out, to be honest with you. That movie's probably, like, a 2014 or 15 release, I would bet. Telling you, man. the, The days of the movies, like, Kingpin are over. We're no, gonna... 21 Jump Street was 2012, actually. So that was probably 22 Jump Street I was thinking of that came out a little later. Or I'm still tripping. Dude, I'm missing 10 and years maybe... of my life where comedies could have came out and I would be able to enjoy them. 22 Jump Street was in 2014. And that was still that was still definitely a must-see movie. If you saw 21, you weren't not going to go see 22. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I think maybe your best bet, instead of just trying to figure out the movies in general, just... Think of actors or actresses that you enjoy in comedies, and I guarantee you there's probably something that they've done that you've seen. You're just not thinking of it. There's been so much content from literally everybody. Like, I guarantee... Well, that's also another thing. A lot of these people, too, like your Jonah Hill and Michael Sarah's and shit, they're not even doing comedies that much anymore. They're mostly sticking to indies and dramas and shit because they're trying to get out of that shtick. Freaking, uh, what's his face from The Hangovers? Not Zach, not Zach Galifianakis, but, uh... Oh, the dude who killed himself in that movie with Bradley Cooper. Yeah, <laughs> I spoil the ending of the movie. You fill in the name. <laughs> Spoilers for a movie. I don't care. It's been out for a while. Yeah. Or movie. Yeah. Don't know yeah. what. Mo- not gonna say what movie. Not gonna say what movie. movie. But you know the ending now. 
Yeah, Bradley yeah. Cooper. Like he hasn't. I haven't seen like a comedy with him. The only thing I see is oh, the only comedy I see that they're trying to hype up like it's a good movie is that fucking dog movie with uh, what's his face from Twenty One Jump Street. Channing oh, Tatum. Channing Tatum. Yeah, they no, I literally that YouTube, shit. and that's the only ad I swear on YouTube is this fucking dog film. I don't know. I don't pay for ads. <laughs> I know you got that YouTube red. Yeah, I pay the the chump change every month to not watch the fucking ads. I feel that. I just can't Fuck help it, man. That I like, shit. I like I like, su- I like supporting free culture. YouTube should be free. Free. Well, you know what? Here's here's a decent movie. I don't know if you watched it. Did you watch uh, Booksmart on HBO? No, no, but I've heard it's very good. Yes, Booksmart is fucking awesome. As, uh, Jonas Hill's sister. Yep. Which is weird, because I think her name is fucking, like, Beanie Siegel or some shit. No, it's Feinstein or something like that. It's very it? Jewish. Oh, it's Beanie Feldstein, that's it. Yep. Yeah, because every time oh. I hear her name, the fact that her name is Beanie, I'm like, yo, like, the Philadelphia rapper Beanie Siegel? <laughs> and I was like, yo, has she got the same name? What the fuck? That'd be dope. But no, that was a solid movie. That was a 2019 release. I'm pretty sure that... I think that... Wait, maybe... Was that an HBO Direct release? Or? No, I, I think it was in theaters for a little bit. Was it in theaters? I think so. Hmm. I know when I watched it, it was on HBO I think it was a limi- or something. I think it was a limited release, though, so I don't think it was, like, you know, nationwide. I feel that. Well, hell, man. I didn't mean to take up 20 minutes of our time talking about comedies. We got a, we got an episode to get to. Man. A historical fiction episode. A historical. Get ready to laugh your fucking tits off. Adventure <laughs> films. <laughs> All right. Get ready to get ready to not be bored at all because this is only a very fucking specific fucking genre for certain people. How yeah hard do you rate this assignment? This one was tough on a scale of fucking one to ten. To be I'm honest, not, I don't honestly. I didn't have that much of a hard time. I'm gonna give it a straight up five. Which was I just the hardest don't part? The hardest part? Yeah, for you. We'll trying to, just trying to stay in genre because I'm telling you, it would have been so much easier to do a historical fiction comedy mm-hmm. or historical fiction oh, sci-fi sure. fantasy adventure, something like that. But to mm-hmm. keep it rooted and yet still have fiction and adventure was kind of tough because how the, it's hard to tell that story without being boring. Because I get that it's not it's not easy. So hopefully. Yeah. What that's... what what I've been able to come up with personally will will work, and I definitely made sure I didn't touch a single fucking thing outside of the world of reality. Like <laughs> this bitch is fully grounded. It's just oh, silly. Yep. Yeah. 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 It's... Straight up. I will say that. Hardest part for me was the was writing six characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was so we, hard. They have gone too far by giving us six characters. That's my bad. That was like. I was good at four, and then I was like, fuck, I gotta write two more people into this. Somehow. I get that. Oh, it don't on... make sense, but it, they're in there. Dude, I, I had to do a fucking full-on rewrite, because I had, well, not a full-on re- I had the characters all written in, then I was like, shit, who the fuck are my actors? I could only remember that I had fucking Bradley Cooper, John Goodman, Margot Robbie. I forgot the whole bottom half of my fucking list. <laughs> I also fucked myself by doing a, a bit. By having all, all actors that? with DJ as the last, <laughs> <in> their last <laughs> name. <laughs> yeah, you had it harder than ever. I had an easy time. I had. Three it actually wasn't stories. that bad, except for one person mm-hmm. was. I couldn't quite. It just didn't quite work out. But it's fine. Look, we different times. We don't judge. It, oh, boy. Until it's our time to judge, we'll, <laughs> we don't judge. But yeah. <clears throat> no, I think I definitely think like this is a solid five because. I was like all about adventure. And then I started thinking about the historical side of that and I was like how the how the fuck do I write something just in history, it, fiction and adventure that doesn't have sci-fi, that doesn't have fantasy. Uh like that was mind fucking me because I kept wanting to be like this would be cool and I was like oh hold on did they have A this technology and B is this like feasible for the I was like motherfucker 
Dude, literally go back to the last episode for this. Yeah. I know. And I was like, I don't want adventure. I fucking don't want adventure. And boom, fucking adventure. Oh, adventure was fine. It was a historical fiction. It really fucked us. Yeah. I feel like I would have done better with anything but the adventure. I wish I, it was I think, fucking I just think anything that combo but is a hard one. Adventure. That is literally the hardest combo probably on the wheels together. Dude, if I, honestly, yeah. if I would have wrote a drama, I feel I would have felt better. If like, it was a fucking historical fiction drama or oh, something, that's I easy. like, oh, it's about to go down. Done deal. Yeah. Absolutely. This fucking adventure shit. I was like, bitch, you're an adventure. This is stupid. I fucking hate it here. Well, like, which, we have to write this, though. <laughs> it's like, this it has is... to come out. It is difficult. Should we start in draft order? DAE? Yeah, we can We can do that. That's fine. Fuck yeah. I mean, you can introduce your uh, characters and tell the story of of your story. I, I got nothing. I, that's as far as my brain went. So... The way I'm gonna roll through it is, I think I'm just gonna I'm gonna do story, let the characters come out through the explanation, and then title at the end. Okay. Um. But yeah, that's the way I'm gonna roll through it. My I don't know about you guys, and you tell me this as well. Is your shit like probably longer than you feel it should be? Because I feel like I'm gonna be talking oh. for fucking ever. Yeah. No. Yeah. I yeah. I wrote this down in Word. I have. <laughs> Well, I have twelve hundred words. All right, who's ready to go to bed? Let's fucking I, uh, do it. I, yeah, I got like. Some <laughs> it's gonna be long. All the fuck it's gonna be long. Hey, look, look, we Oof. told people this is a story summary. This is a full length movie. You're getting in like a five minute rant. I still may paraphrase. I don't think I can. I don't even know if I could kill it in five minutes. Like, I hope I can. I don't know how long this is, but I feel like looking at it, it's too long. But yeah, if I it's... didn't do this, I felt like I was instantly going to be the loser for being like, I wrote yep. down four words. <laughs> yeah. I wrote a story. Fucking... Totally, totally fine, man. <laughs> Roll through it. Let's do it. All right. We're going to set the scene. The movie starts with a time stamp, little date. It is August 1st, 1943. We are in the ocean. You're going to see the ship PT-109 written on the side of it. As you see it cruise... Across the screen, it is instantly split in half by a gigantic fucking boat with a Japanese flag painted on the side of it. It is a Japanese destroyer boat ramming through this small PT-109 boat. After the boat hits, the boat is literally... After the fucking Japanese boat hits the PT, the PT boat is literally in two. Starts sinking, going right underwater. This is not a heavily manned ship. But once it got hit, everyone assumed that every single person on this ship was dead. But there was one brave soldier who led himself and ten other good men out of the boat. Now, in between this scene, there's going to be the whole classic, holy shit, the boat's filling up with water, we're turning the water locks, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're getting through all that sheen. Hold your breath, we gotta take a dive, you know, all that dope shit. After they do that whole scene... They're going to get out and they're going to find debris from the ship floating around. They're going to actually jump on top of it and hold themselves up by it to keep themselves afloat because that was one hell of an ordeal. After they do that, they're going to float ashore on the islands. This is where you'll start to get a little setting. There are islands that they were floating near and that they were going by. Um, once you get onto the island, there's going to be some talk back and forth with the men. As the talk goes back and forth... You're going to realize the man who led them out of the boat is John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy, while on the island, decides the only way to get help is to make contact with the native people of this island. And he takes a coconut because they don't speak English and writes, 11 men still alive, send a small boat. It is written inside the coconut and the two natives that he found basically go across the other side of the island, give the note to the commander, they bring a small ship across around the island. And they pick them up. All of the men are boarding. There is 10 of the 11 men currently boarding this ship. The last man was not a part of the Navy like the other 10 were. This man actually happened to be a Marine. And this Marine's name was only written on his patch with his last name that said Oswald, played by Christian Bale. Also, my JFK character is Bradley Cooper. So, mm. JFK is Bradley Cooper. Christian Bale is Oswald. And as Oswald is making his way up through the water into the boat, 
he kind of loses his footing, falls, slips, and JFK, being the fucking monster that he was, runs up, picks him up, and he starts kind of like, you know, fucking with him a little bit. And he's like, what's the matter, man? After all that, you still don't have your sea legs? Come on, <laughs> let's get aboard and let's go home. So as they're going home and they're getting on the ship, we're just going to have a regular cut scene. It's just going to be a quick flash. You're at a ceremony. JFK is receiving in front of a large crowd, including all of the other 10 men that he saved, is uh, two medals, one from the Navy and one from the Marines, because he saved a Marine, is the Medal of Galantry, which is a medal given to any soldier who leads other people out of a hazardous situation. So because he saved the Marine and because he saved his Navy buddies, got him out. Now, after he got them out... You are going to cut to Oswald in the fucking crowd, just kind of like clapping, but you're going to get that little mental speech inside. You're going to get that little inner dialogue where he's just kind of pissed. He's like, dude, fuck this guy. He's like, I could have got out without him. I didn't need him. I'm a fucking Marine. I didn't need a Navy fucking steel loser to save my life. He's like, get out of here. Now that's what's going on in his mind. But as the medals are given and that scene goes through, we're actually going to cut right to the office, the Oval Office, JFK is now president, and he is speaking to LBJ, Lyndon B. Johnson. As he's speaking with Lyndon B. Johnson, Lyndon B. Johnson has his back turned. He's just kind of, you know, just listening to the president. He's rambling on, turns around. It's John Goodman. John Goodman is my LBJ. Now, from that point, uh, the whole speech that JFK is currently giving to LBJ, he's like, Man, I don't understand why our country is seeing black people as the enemy, because this is a huge civil rights moment still. He's like, I don't understand what I have to do or what we need to do to make this country great again and to bring all of our brothers together. He's like, you have no idea how many times while being in the military that a black man has saved my life. He's like, if a black man's willing to save my life here, then I guarantee you they're willing to do it on their own country. There's no reason for us not to unify. And LBJ's like, yeah, of course, and you're the greatest president we've ever had. We should absolutely do that. You're the smartest man I've ever met, and I think that's the smartest idea ever, blah, blah, blah. As he says it, you can see that he doesn't really mean it. These are not <laughs> true words. He's just like, I'm vice president, you're president, whatever you say. I'll go along with it because I want to still be vice president. So, of course, I'm going to go along with whatever you say. So, after that little speech happens, um, we're going to move through... A little, little, little fade to black, and we're going to see that JFK is, you know, he's out and about, you know? He's got his Secret Service. Secret Service is everywhere, and he happens to see a movie poster. And in this movie poster, he sees the main leading actress is Marilyn Monroe, and he's like, holy shit. I want that ass so fucking bad. He's like, man, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get it. I'm trying to get it. So... You know, he kind of decides he's going to work his way out to uh, California, make his way into Hollywood. And sure enough, with no time at all, the president going to California didn't take anybody long, especially a Hollywood actress, to realize, oh, I wonder what the president's doing here. So they meet up, and he realizes he's completely fucking obsessed with her. She's trying to get on that president dick. And sure enough, he gives it to her so fucking good that now they are in a behind the scenes relationship and she's like man that jfk dick was tight that was awesome and sure enough my marilyn monroe character is margot robbie so from that point on these two are completely obsessed with each other man like they're trying to fucking get back and forth to one another as much as possible without anybody finding out you got jfk trying to keep his secret service under hush hush she's trying to make sure that all these actors and other directors are not seeing him showing up on set, and they're just pounding away constantly, fucking, because right now, JFK, he's not getting no ass, man. His wife has given him nothing. He's not really feeling it. So, of course, he, uh, you know, he looks for love elsewhere, but he falls in love with her, and they both trust each other so much, just to an extreme extent. So one night, after absolute passionate lovemaking and just potential anal, he... <laughs> He, um, he's laying down with her. He's smoking a cigar because he's a beast. And she's like, I want to hear the story about you saving these 10 men. Because that's one of the bravest things I've ever heard in my entire life. 
So he basically recants the same story. I don't have to repeat it from the beginning. Except he adds one vital detail. That the reason they were actually out near those waters, by these islands, by Japan, is because they actually filled the ship with stolen Japanese gold. And they were taking this gold back to America, and they were going to basically, you know, use it for if any wartime came or anything else happened. They had all these precious metals they can sell and do whatever they want with. He then explains to her the island that they crashed on before they crashed and why they were near that island is because they were worried they were going to get attacked. So they dropped all the gold off on the island, buried it, put it away so no one would ever find it, got back on the ship as soon as possible. By the time they were back on the ship and away from the island, that destroyer came in and just plowed through, wrecked it, destroyed the entire thing, thinking they killed all the soldiers. From that point, he was like, man, I just don't know if I'll ever be able to see that gold again. He's like, what a fortune that was. He's like, you have no idea what's buried on that island. And she's like, that is one of the absolute greatest stories I've ever heard. And once again, we're just going to fade away. And we're going to see LBJ, John Goodman, just kind of like sitting back and forth in his office wondering, like, what am I going to do about this guy? This country is so pushing away from him because of his civil rights movement that he wants to do. I don't know how we're ever going to get this country back on our side. And sure enough, with him being the vice president, he already knows what's going on between him and Marilyn Monroe. So he's like, is there any way I can use that against him? Is there anything I can do? Well... Sure enough, our good buddy, Lee Harvey Oswalt, is stewing in a bar, pissed off, upset, still like, dude, I fucking hate this man. He saves my life, I could have saved him myself, now he's president, I can't fucking stand him. He doesn't know anything about the Marilyn Monroe shit, you know, he's just stewing in a bar. And it turns out the bar slash nightclub he in is owned by a man named Jack Ruby. And Jack Ruby is played by Daniel Craig. So as they're sitting there spouting off how they hate JFK and everything, they're trying to hatch a scheme like, what the fuck can we do? He's like, you hate him, I hate him. What could we do to possibly ruin this man's life and get him out of office and just destroy him? So they come up with nothing, absolutely nothing. So they start going on their own little fucking like mission to figure out what they can do to find dirt on this guy. Well, sure enough, knowing that it's the president, the Secret Service finds out this information quickly and takes it right to LBJ. LBJ being John Goodman, he's like, oh, no, that's terrible. He's like, you know what? Don't you worry about this. I'm going to talk to the director of the FBI. We're going to get home with security down there. Don't worry about it. This is already taken care of. Wipe it off the board. LBJ makes a personal trip down to Jack Ruby's bar, <laughs> and he says, hey, man, I want to talk to you. They're like, aren't you fucking the vice president? He's like, yeah, I sure am. He's like, I want to talk to you about this, uh, this little scheme you guys are hatching. And he's like, there's no scheme. And he gets Oswald down there, calls him in, and they have this little powwow. He's like, I bet you guys didn't know that the president's currently having an affair with Marilyn Monroe. He's like, I guarantee you that I can get people close enough to the president to get detailed pictures, recordings, whatever we need. And then we'll use it against him, and we'll just scam him right out of office. All three agree. LBJ goes back. He finds out one of the nights that Marilyn Monroe is coming to town. He basically stages a whole ploy. He gets a camera set up. He's got his own little spy outside from another hotel snapping pictures. He gets the pictures he wants. Gets everything he needs. Sends it back to Oswald and uh, Jack Ruby. They take it and they put together their own little note with just bits of the film. But, you know, it's just copies of it. And he sends it out. Once again, the director of the Secret Service, he gets the letter, shows it to LBJ, and he goes, sir, what do we do about this? He's like, well, don't worry about it. You know what? We're not going to negotiate with people who would try to blackmail the president. He's like, don't worry about this. We'll just, we'll just sweep this under the rug and we'll get it taken care of. So he goes ahead and he takes it to Kennedy, shows him what's going on. He's like, John, listen, I know what's going on. I know you didn't want this to come out and come to light, but these guys want basically your entire fortune. He's like, if you're not going to pay it, they're going to release it. And he goes, well, how credible do you think this is? He's like, you know, they have this, they have A, B, and C, but you know what? I can't imagine anybody actually doing this to the president. 
sure enough, and headlines about two days later because he didn't pay, everything gets released. JFK then decides he's going to run a campaign and he's going to try to hush every single person, media outlet, everything, spend every single dollar he has to try to save himself. Tries to save himself, spends literally every dollar. Doesn't have a whole lot left to his name besides the fact that he's the president. So, didn't work. Obviously, when a headline like that goes into play, there was nothing he could figure out to do. So, one night, him and Marilyn meet up again, you know, in their own little private area. And they kind of like spitball conversation, like, what could we possibly do to get this out of the news and get it out of headlines? How do we, how do we put the focus somewhere else, not to ruin my campaign and ruin what we're going to have later once this is over? Because he was basically playing the whole, I'm going to leave my wife. Once this is done, divorce my wife, it's you and me, baby, and then we're good. They come up with the idea, what if she faked her death and committed suicide via overdose because she was known for being a scandalous drug-using actress in Hollywood. It was all the rage. Many people overdosed. What was the problem? All they had to do was find a girl that looked just like her who recently died, and every girl at the time wanted to look like Marilyn Monroe. They just waited for the perfect opportunity. They took the last of his money. They paid off the coroner, and they paid off the, you know, people who would come in and pick up the body, like, you know, the local cops and everything else, and they staged her death. So after they stage her death, the only headline in the news is just that Marilyn Monroe has overdosed. Oswald, LBJ, and Jack Ruby are pissed because now none of them have any money and none of their plan has come to light. So as JFK is now hiding Marilyn Monroe, like a little safe house, he shows up, he's like, I think the only way to save this campaign, to put any money in our pockets, and when this is all over for us to run away forever, we have to go get that gold off the island. So, they stage a little plan to get down to Texas. Currently in Texas is a man named John Connolly. <laughs> John Connolly is the appointed secretary of the Navy via JFK. So JFK goes and he speaks to him. He's like, hey man, we have the exact same ideas. This is the whole story. This is what's going on. Can you help me get out of the country? And let's go get this gold. We'll give you a piece of it. You can use it for your campaign. I'm going to take the majority and give it to myself, et cetera, et cetera. He's like, absolutely. He's like, 100%. We're going to do that. Let's go get this fucking gold. So they book a flight to get down to, where did I put it? Uh, in Florida. And they were going to leave out of, I forget, I picked some international fucking airport, whatever. Mm. So they get their whole fake aliases and they get everything set up. But sure enough, LBJ has what I'll refer to as just little informants everywhere. This guy is getting every piece of information wherever it goes. He knew Marilyn wasn't dead. He knew John was up to something, but he didn't know what. And finally he starts piecing it together. He's like, holy shit, he's leaving the country. Why? Why is he going? He figures it out and he goes, oh my god, this is that fucking naval story that he told so long ago. There's no way this was true. We all thought it was bullshit when he told us the story. LBJ makes a plan to then go meet up with Oswald and Ruby. And they get to the island and leave before JFK actually gets there. So as they're there, they're hanging out in the nearest hotel by the islands. And they decide they're going to hang out in this fucking little fucking, like, hotel in slash bar place. This is like some real, like, goofy Asian rickety place. They're hanging out in the bar. And sure enough, the next people that walk in, like, about 12 hours after them, you have Marilyn Monroe, JFK, and Jack Connolly. They're there to get the gold. But before they can do it, they need a place to rest, and they're going to go do it that morning. So as they get into this little, like, bar, sketchy place, if LBJ is noticed, everything's fucked. If Oswald is noticed, everything's fucked. There's no way JFK is not going to notice either of these two people. Jack Ruby being a nightclub slash bar owner and a total bar fly, he just happens to work his magic and get next to him while they're talking and figuring out their plan and drawing everything out, and he hears every piece of info that he needs. 
jots it down, takes it back to LBJ and Oswald, and they plan their ambush. So they get out into this jungly patch first before they could get there, obviously, before JFK and his crew could get there. JFK, Marilyn Monroe, and John Connolly, they get to their spot, they start digging, find this huge, massive fucking tarp that's just been absolutely folded over, tucked every which way, and inside is just mountains of fucking gold. It's like bars, little trinkets, all that shit, you know, crazy Japanese art, all that stuff that we made out of gold, all that shit's in there. So as they're pulling the tarp, they check it out, they back it up, they're going to leave. Ruby and Oswald pop up. And they're like, you're not going anywhere. And JFK instantly realized who Oswald is. He's like, what the fuck are you doing here? He's like, why would, he's like, what, like, what made you come back here? And he's like, did you want the gold too? And he's like, no, not so much. He's like, the gold's kind of just a bonus. He's like, I'm here to kill you. I want you dead. After all these years, I can't stand what you've become. Jack Ruby's only stake in the game is that He's with Oswald. He hates JFK, too. He wants him dead. LBJ is now hiding behind just a big old patch of jungly brush, and he's just watching it all go down. Sure enough, he's a Marine. Being Lee Harvey Oswald pulls out a 1911. Jack Ruby also has a 1911. JFK was not an ill-prepared man. He breaks out his gun. Connolly breaks out his there's a fucking shootout on the island, man. They want the gold. They're fucking shooting at each other. They're blasting, missing every shot. Because, you know, that's just what happens. Jack Ruby runs out of ammo. He's not a fucking military guy. Fucking runs. He's out of there. Connolly goes chasing after him. JFK's out of ammo. Oswald's out of ammo. JFK starts talking that shit. He's like, come on, bitch. Get out here. You won't fight me. You know, he's like, you're not going to do this. What's the matter? You can't do it without your gun. Oswald was not going to take that as a Marine. So he comes stomping out. And they just start throwing hands, dude. They're fucking... It is just fisticuffs, man. It is just blast after blast. But JFK is strategically working his way back to the water. He's, like, taking the hits, moving back, circling around him, pushing him back. They're moving back to the water. And once he gets him in a couple inches of water and he knows he's kind of got him, he starts really laying a town on him, man. He starts using the water against him. He's got him trying to back up through the water, but he can't pick up his feet fast enough. So JFK's hitting with body shots, face shots, just tearing this man apart. After he finally drops him, this man goes face first into the water, assuming that he's probably not going to survive. He starts walking off, and he's like, that's what I thought, Oswald. I see you still don't have your sea legs, and he just takes off. He starts jaunting away. Connolly comes back. He's like, hey, man, I can't find that other guy. I have no idea where he went. He's like, don't worry about it. This guy's dead. I got no idea what that guy's going to do. Never seen him before. Let's get this gold. Let's get out of here. They haul ass, man. They grab that shit. They run. They're going. They're getting out of here. They've got their gold. They've got what they've set out to get. They wanted the gold. They got it. They're leaving. Time to go home. LBJ works his way out of that little jungly patch, pulls Oswald out of the water. Motherfucker's not dead. Ruby ran back to the fucking hotel slash bar they were in before that. They find him sitting there at the bar drinking, waiting to see if anybody was going to come back. Of course, they all come back. LBJ was never known that he was there. Now, Ruby and Oswald are the only targets, but they still don't know who the fuck Jack Ruby is. They only know him by his face. Well, the first place they decide to go back to is Texas. John Connolly's like, hey, man, don't worry about it. I'm going to put you here. I'm going to take my cut. You guys are going to hang out, and then you can go back to D.C., and I'll take care of Maryland. He's like, don't worry about it. He's like... Last year, I took this amazing vacation down to San Juan, Puerto Rico. It was the greatest vacation I've ever taken in my entire life. And that's where I'm going to retire. He tells John, he's like, take this portion of gold, put Marilyn on a boat, get her to Puerto Rico. I will meet her there in a year. He's like, after this election's done and I get through all this, I will come back and I will get her. The next thing he does, he goes back. He goes right back to D.C. Talks to his wife, blah, 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 whatever. Their marriage is dead. She doesn't really give a shit what the fuck he's doing. He decides, well, I guess it's time to start running the last bit of this campaign. But sure enough, one of the first places he goes, he's like, how about I go visit my good buddy John? It's been a couple months. I got to get my campaign rolling, and why not roll down to Texas? He's my best endorsement right now. One of the biggest states with the most votes and biggest electoral college. I'll head that way. The only thing is, LBJ already expected that. LBJ knew that Connolly was there. 
LBJ then orchestrates with Oswald the assassination of JFK. Gets him in the fucking library. Gets him his gun. Tells him when and where. You can act out the rest. Man shot. Head blown everywhere. Connolly loses his mind. His wife is like, holy shit, somebody just shot this motherfucker. And, you know, tries to cover herself up. And she's like, oh my god, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. This news then makes its way directly to Marilyn Monroe. This is world-breaking news. She couldn't believe. She was like, oh my God, how could this happen? She's like, I don't want to be in a world where I don't have John. So she decides, well, the same way they played off the overdose on the girl that they dug up and, you know, signed over to the corner. She was going to do the same thing. She just took a fistful of pills, drank a bunch of alcohol, OD. Nobody knew who she was because Marilyn Monroe was already dead. And this is San Juan, Puerto Rico. It's just some, some dead white woman. They don't care. Cut to LBJ is just worried. He's like, man, what if Oswald tells? What if he squeals? What am I supposed to do? How do I get through this? Sure enough, he's like, Jack, what if you go kill Oswald? He's like, I can't. He's like, yes, you can. He's like, go out. Just shoot him. Don't worry about it. He's like, because nobody would ever ever think a bad thought about the guy who murdered the man who killed the president jack ruby he goes commits the murder kills oswald oswald never gets to talk no one ever knows what happens after that because jack ruby refused to talk and lbj never does anything for the man lbj lives happily ever after john and marilyn are dead so is oswald and Ruby basically just lives out his life until he dies. Prison. In. I'm clapping. Historical adventure. Histor historical fiction adventure. <laughs> do, do we ask questions now on the story, Adam? Do you think we can air comment? Cause like, yeah, I think like we can comment. Yeah. Fit, oh, what's like the title, David? Oh, yeah, yeah. oh, and the title, I don't. I didn't really know what to call it. I was just going to call it <laughs> fucking J John. Well, probably just JFK, the untold story. <laughs> I dig it. Just, okay. that just that classic moniker of a fucking story for fiction. All right. I'm trying to think of, like, a perfect question. Or, or should we ask, like... I think we just comment on it. I don't oh, think we have ahead, to ask questions. Just, I mean, what are you your could thoughts? do whatever. I'm, yeah, just go ahead. There's a lot. It is a lot. It was a lot. I said. I got, a lot. I got lost a lot. I got lost <laughs> pretty early on. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but, like, you were... You, I, think, I think you got... Too much into setting up the scenes and not mm -hmm. telling the story, which made it drag on a lot. But I will say, I mean, not saying it's a bad thing; it was good. But I, like, I got ending. lost. Ending was great. I think the beginning just there's too much there, and then the end it just kind of was there. To, to I can't. I think I'm trying to figure out the beginning of the story is setting up why Oswald hates JFK, and then correct. Okay. And then yep. the middle of the story is just what JFK is up to while Oswald's doing nothing. And then the ending of the story is Oswald gets his revenge. And in doing so, hides the fact that the gold uh, seemed to just disappear amongst the um, president and uh, Ruby. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. It's just gone. Well, no one knows because Marilyn Monroe had her chunk. John Connolly has his. John yep. lived. John does whatever. Now John Connolly the fourth is some type of politician. So honest. So every point that I made. So like the ship being split in half. That's true. The islands. That's true. The only made up part in the in the shit is Marilyn Monroe, mm. the LBJ portion, and the gold. Everything else is no, yeah, basically that's real. So oh, yeah, that's I, what I was trying to get into like where the historical. Then they're like, met listen, the motherfuckers, you can look it up. No, that mean, boat's it, real. No, <laughs> <laughs> the historical no, saying, part would have been like. Weird. JFK. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Because I, I was. I didn't want to be that guy. I was, I was like, trying to stick to the historical so side. Yeah. I was trying to stick to the historical side without it being like way out. You but were the so only in place... the historical nonfiction that you forget, like you you squeezed in. Well, the that's fiction, you know. What I mean? like... Well, that's the part. I was like, I was like, well, what uh... would what would have been cool? I was like, maybe Marilyn didn't die, and then I was no, like, no, well, what good. the fuck? I was like, what type of adventure do you send JFK on? I was like, 
Same adventure you send every asshole on in a fucking historical fiction. Go get some gold, dude. Like, go find a treasure. No, I was like, you need something. Almost every fucking adventure story leads to some type of monetary something. So it's like, fuck it, gold is cool. No, I liked it. We're gonna go get that goddamn gold. <laughs> it was just funny, because at one point I looked at Adam, and then he kind of looked at me, and I was like, both of us are lost, and we don't want to interrupt. <laughs> we didn't want to yeah. be like, wait, can you go back? <laughs> like... <laughs> And I just like, I giggled because I was like I liked what was happening. It's just I had a moment where I was like, oh fuck, I forget. Yeah, you setting. lost me for like five seconds. I went, yeah. oh shit, I missed something. But, well, that was the thing. I didn't. Oh, well, for me, I was like, do I go the no, dialogue you're... portion or do I go for the scene overall? And I was like, well, who gives a shit about what they're saying? That's like that's yeah. kind of where I left. Yeah. I was yeah, like, that's fine. I was like, it's more for the scene, right? If if mm-hmm. not. The di- I was like, I really didn't know what to put. If I was going to write the dialogue only, no, I'd, I'd, no, I'd no, probably no. still be talking. Well, look, man, this I put, like, zero dialogue yeah, in Yeah, I was going to say, this thing's, like, the first part of, or I guess this is the first part It's just, like, doing telling the story. Yeah. yeah. So, so it, was a, it, was a, it was a heavy setup. It was not a synopsis. It was a full a, rundown. It's fine. I feel like yeah. mine's going to be a fucking paraphrase compared to that. Yeah. Yeah, same. Mine's going to be a lot shorter. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, but it's cool. All right, Adam. Go ahead, man. Real estate, All right. movie two. Movie two. Called Westward Bound. I don't like it. You lose. No. <laughs> okay. Fuck you. <laughs> All right. Uh, story starts off with Roy Bennett, played by John Hamm, and his brother Wesley, played by Tom Hardy. They're in the mil- in the military in like the mid eighteen hundreds, eighteen forties, eighteen fifties. They're out in the, in, in the, in the West kind of, you know, fighting off Indians and kind of securing lands and things like that. Um, cut to, now they're back East. They're done with the military. They're, they're not enlisted anymore. They're starting their lives up back East. Um, Roy, his wife is Clara, played by Selma Hayek. Uh, they're just kind of farmers in the East, just trying to make a living. Uh, they have two daughters. Who tragically kind of die right in the beginning in a farming accident, so they're they're kind of grieving. Um, he said, "You know what? This over here the, on the east side, not our not our place. You know, we have bad vibes over here. We're gonna pack up, head west. We're gonna hit the Oregon Trail. Classic adventure. The story's already written, basically, um, but." To join them, they ask um, Clara's brother, Guy, who is played by Bill Hader, and his wife to join them on the on the on the trip, um, along with along with Wesley to join them. So they have a group of five. They're they're making their way over to Independence, Missouri, to get their their start on the Oregon Trail. Once there, they're going to meet up with some other groups to kind of get a caravan together, so they're not just one one you know wagon going um they meet up with you know probably about 10 or 11 other other families and wagons they're all going to kind of group together and go one of those families is the chase family uh led by the father luther chase played by ethan hawk his wife and he has four kids with him the oldest one is her name is daisy and that would be lucy hale they're all joining together. They're all kind of getting all their stuff together, getting all their supplies. They're getting to know each other, talking about their backgrounds, things like that, to figure out kind of who's going to lead the pack. They all kind of decide, well, Roy, he's got the the military background. He kind of knows the lands out there on the western side of the, the country. We're going to make him kind of our leader. That's who we're going to kind of listen to, and he's going to kind of guide us out there. So they get started. On the, on the on the adventure there, um, spring 1851. We're gonna start out montage. It's all gonna be going well. Just kind of traveling, eating, having good times. You know, as as the beginning of trips always end up that way. They're always a lot of fun to start it out. Um, like I said, they're just kind of going along, having having a good time. Um, Guy is kind of cracking jokes the whole time, saying that he's a better cook than everyone there, and all this, all this kind of stuff. So he's just he's kind of the comic relief of the movie. Um, jump to or about six, seven weeks into the trip, you know they're they're 
a good good bit outside of Missouri. Uh, first be, first kind of real bad thunderstorm they've experienced where they kind of got to stop and like camp for the night and kind of see, wait for this thing to kind of pass over so they don't kind of get lost or or kind of get stuck in the mud as they're going along with all those their wagon wheels and shit like that. Um, Roy's saying, you know, let's wait it out. Luther's saying, no, we need to keep moving. You know, we got, you know, only so much time before, you know, the really bad weather comes in the winter when we get out there in the middle of nowhere. Roy's saying, no, 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 let's wait it out. It's, you know, it's only going to be like one day. Let's, let's wait it out. We can make up time a little bit down the road. Well, they, so they waited out. A um, couple of members of other wagons that kind of catch the flu. They're a little sick. They kind of, one or two wagons, they kind of turn around and say, you know what, it's not worth it. We're going to go back east and, and figure it out. So then now they're down two wagons. Um, they keep on going. Uh, another little montage, just traveling, nothing, nothing crazy. Um, next thing you know, Luther's wheels kind of busted right so he's he's asking everybody but roy for help to fix his wheel he doesn't like roy he he thinks that he should be in charge whatever um roy has the part that he needs everyone else didn't doesn't have a spare part for him uh roy has one he offers it to him he turns him down uh luther turns roy down then you know clara kind of goes and talks to him a little bit and they're kind of says, Hey, just take it. You know, we'll, you can repay us later. You know, it's, it's no big deal. Like, let's just keep it. Let's keep this thing moving. Um, so they get going. Um, he, he finally kind of says, okay, sure. Let's, I'll, I'll take the part. I'll take the help and let's, let's just keep the train moving. Um, during this whole thing, um, uh, Wesley and Daisy go out, try to get some hunting, trying to forge for some berries, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they're and the, they're kind of getting very close. They're flirting, that kind of stuff. They end up hooking up out in the woods while they're fixing this wagon. Lo and behold, Prego, he didn't pull out. What an idiot. She gets pregnant. They don't obviously don't know it right away, but that's what happens. Next thing we know, they get back on the road. They're they're moving along here. Um they get approached by like a small group of native native americans luther obviously he's never been out west he hasn't really experienced any native americans in his life before so he's very kind of skittish he's like oh i don't trust them at all i've only heard the stories in the newspaper of all the bad things that have happened and all this kind of stuff roy and wesley obviously they've dealt with them before um being in the military and they they know that this group is friendly they're showing peace signs they kind of, you know, flash the peace sign back to them so that they know they can join up and talk and, and, and see what's going on. So they're, they're talking, they, they decide they, they're going to trade some goods back and forth, you know, get some, get some different food in their bellies. They're going to trade some of their stuff to the Native Americans so they can kind of diversify their diet as well. Everything's happy. Everything's going well. Uh, Native Americans, they go back to their their tribe and their camp and they're gathering their goods to bring back to trade um roy goes off he's going to help some other families do some other stuff fixing up their wagons things like that um so whenever the native americans are coming back roy's not there to kind of greet them but luther is and he doesn't know what the peace sign that they're showing is he's kind of real real kind of weary about it he shoots one of the indians and kills him so now Roy's like, oh, fuck, what was that gunshot? He comes flying back. He's like, Luther, what the fuck are you doing? You know, they're treating, you know, we're trading with them, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, so then Roy is, is kind of going over to the Indians saying, hey, it was, a, it was an accident, it was a mistake. You know, let's, let's kind of settle this out. Like, I, I don't want any issues or anything like that. Let's just kind of, let's do it peacefully. So the deal that came upon was, you know, Roy and, and them would give them a little bit of a better deal. They'd throw in some extra stuff on top of what what they were already going to be trading anyways. Um, and then to punish Luther for killing the guy, he's like, well, it's going to come out of Luther's shit. He's going he's gonna to pay the extra 
for this for this deal. Um, obviously, Luther's all kind of he's real pissed off about that. He storms off. Again, Clara, she's kind of the the peacemaker. She goes and talks to him. She's like, "Hey, let let's calm down here. You know, let you know we'll we'll still kind of we'll divvy out the rest of our our stuff to you when you need it. You know, we'll we'll kind of ration out some extras for you uh, whenever you are starting to run low on things and and you can't make it through. You know, we'll we'll figure all that out." Um, so he's like, "All right, all right, whatever. You know, but they're still, you know, I'm not happy, but." They continue on. Um, so they're they're going along the way. Again, montage. It's a long-ass journey, so we're just going to montage it a little bit here. Finally make it to the North Platte River, which is one of like the more dangerous crossings on the Oregon Trail. Um, Roy kind of gets up to the, to the river. He's looking at it. He's like, boy, this is looking pretty rough right now. Like, it's let's let's settle down for for the night let's kind of see if it's a little calmer in the morning see if it's it slows down a little bit maybe it, it'll lower a little bit in the morning make it a little easier to cross luther obviously hard-headed he's like no we need to go now because you know we've lost days you know back sitting out storms we need to keep moving to get across the river roy's like eh, i don't think so let's let's see how it goes you know, if, if anything, we can go up river. There's a ferry up there, about two days ride. We can get on the ferry to cross us, to, you know, to get us across the river. And then we won't have, you know, there won't be any risk really involved with, with losing people or wagons or supplies or anything like that. Group votes, they're like, all right, yeah, let's, let's stay the night. Let's see how it is in the morning. Then we'll decide. Well, when they get up in the morning, they see another group is crossing the river. They don't make it. Not all of them make it. Probably about 50% of their supplies and wagons and things topple over. They lose like a lot of their animals, a lot of their people and everything like that. Roy says, no, we're not going there. We're going up to the ferry. I don't care what it costs. We're taking the ferry. Luther's very upset about this because he's not very well off. He's kind of, he's very poor. He's like, I don't know if I can even afford the ferry. But they kind of, they get him talk down enough to where he's like, okay, that's, that's fine. We'll do it. We'll, we'll take the ferry. Um, it's not an easy journey across on the ferry. It, it, it almost capsizes a couple of times. We'll, we'll take in a couple of the carts over. Um, but they, they get over to very minimal losses of supply. So it's a, it's a good success. So they keep on going. Um, you know, a few, few weeks down the road there, Luther's family, they're out of clean water on their on their cabin. We all know what's coming now, right? He's going to find some, some dirty-ass water to try to give to his family to keep drinking. He does. He finds some. He brings it up. Roy's like, boy, this water smells funny. Probably shouldn't be drinking this. We'll give you some of ours, and we'll, we'll get some clean water down the road. Luther's like, no way. I'm not taking your water. You've, I'm not taking any of your shit. He gives it to his family youngest son starts feeling pretty sick after drinking that water ends up he gets dysentery he dies pretty quickly did not i mean they're they've been on the the road here for a few months the immune system was pretty much shot plus it's the 1850s so there is no immune system really kid dies the rest of them were like okay they were a little sick but they it's kind of more like food poisoning but um the youngest kid dies Luther's blaming Roy for the for the death of his son because he's like, you didn't stop me from giving him the water, but, you know, Luther's just in his own head. Anyway, they continue on. They dump out the com that contaminated water. They give him, they, they give Luther, they kind of mix up water from different uh, wagons to get to, to get to Luther's family so they can keep on the, on the journey. Um, they keep on moving down the road. Luther's in just increasingly challenging Roy on everything. Like he really does think that he should be in charge of this, this venture. He thinks that Roy is just making decisions so that all the, you know, the, the less well-off people are, are struggling and, and he's, he's doing fine because he, you know, he had the military background. He has some money. Well, 
they're getting to the cold part now, right? They're in the they're up in the mountains. It's getting a little snowy. It's getting colder. Big snowstorm is coming through. Roy's like, you know, let's let's camp out again for the night. Let's let the storm pass because we're not gonna be able to see where we're going. Luther says, Oh no, 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 we're I'm not listening to you anymore. I'm I'm moving on. So him and him and a few of his uh other buddies that are along on the trip they're starting to agree with him they take off he also he's trying to take daisy with him she's pregnant she's like no i'm not going with you i'm staying here with with you know my baby daddy wesley so wesley pulls a gun on him. he's like you're not taking her and then the whole little fight breaks out he ends up leaving daisy with um with wesley and 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 Roy and, and his and their family. So they get they just start out in the in the snow. Um, Guy and his wife they just kind of start joking about cannibalism just to kind of lighten the mood a little bit. Uh, a little Donner party. Um, the storm passes. Then yeah, everyone that that stayed behind they they gather up all their stuff. They get going on the trail. After a few days, they see kind of remnants of the different wagons kind of scattered or scattered along the path and then eventually they see the 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 wagons that left they all kind of crashed and everyone kind of died right there it kind of fell off a cliff or something i don't know i didn't figure that part out but they all died obviously they're they're kind of daisy's very distraught about this she's like i ah, you know why why wouldn't he just stay with us all this kind of stuff um you know that's kind of that's kind of it. They kind of continue on the journey. They make it to like a fort with like pretty much no supplies left. They make it to the fort. They get some help. Um, eventually, and they make it to their destination. End of the movie. Kind of shows where they are. Roy and Clara. They got a kid now. Since their two kids passed in the beginning. Uh, Daisley and Wesley. They're married. They got a. They have their kid. And then. Uh, Guy and his wife are running the restaurant. And I like it. Classic Oregon Trail. Yep. It it made me think of uh, Hatfield and McCoy meets Oregon Trail. A little bit. A little bit. Yeah. I dig that about it though. I love me a western. Yeah, and to be honest, I don't know if two like many movies are really focused strictly on like the actual journey yeah it's more of like bits and pieces of it mm -hmm. but they don't i don't know of many or really any off the top of my head wagons west. that's kind of just that journey you know living that wagon your life yeah like the struggle of not having water yeah uh, we didn't fill up at the river because we're dumb i get that i liked it i dig the movie adam Thank you. It was a great chaos. David, anything? That was probably one of the most... Like, I don't know how to put it, like, without being a gunslinger western, like, one of the most western-y western... I know, right? But yeah, like, yeah. I've probably heard in a while where it's just, like, it's just so fucking, like, specific to that travel where it's, like, the, all the story is all the travel. The story is literally all the bad things you've heard from every one of the different trips across the Oregon Trail yeah. that happened literally in one group. Right. Except yeah. cannibalism. They joked about it, but it didn't They happen. joked about it. They got to lighten yeah. the mood a little bit. <laughs> yeah. No, I dig it. Well, shit. I have to follow you two's. I feel like my story is way shorter. Okay. I mean, just because I wrote, like, I didn't write out moment by moment by moment by moment. I did more of the summary of it, but it's still six pages, so I feel good about it. But um, I'll have to, I'll have to write my title at, for the end, because like I didn't, I didn't have one I loved, but I'll bounce them off you guys afterwards. But um, so my story begins. I'll say basically the cast members. Uh, like who they're playing as their characters come up, and then I'm just gonna refer to them by the actor names because I uh, I felt like I was getting confused if I wrote normal people's names. But nope, you're good. Gary Oldman 
is a rich man from the 1950s who is paying a man who he feels is the only man brave enough to find the fountain of youth. John Wayne, played by Mel Gibson. <clears throat> not understanding that he is not a real adventurer, but an actor, he uh, forces the Duke uh, to lead the expedition. Like Gary Oldman. Um, let me see. Hugh Jackman is an expert in early settler history, and Olivia Wilde is a scientist uh, here to help prove the fountain is real. Um Gary Oldman has also hired Russell Crowe and his wife, Helen Connor, uh, whatever her name is. Helen <laughs> Bonham. How do you say it? H. Bonham Bonham Connor. There we go. Uh, to keep the team on track. Uh, Russell Crowe is clearly an ex army vet of World War I. Uh, they begin their search in the Carolinas, eventually finding a settlement called Roanoke. Uh,. The thing about Roanoke is uh, the settlers that were there were established. A group of people f went back to England to go and check on how things are there and bring back supplies. And when they came back, there was no trace of the people in Roanoke. Uh, the only thing was uh, there was a word written in a tree, and they were never heard from again. <coughs> but they find the moniker in the tree where the wor words were. Uh, and it says, Croatoan. And they're like, oh, Croatoan was the name of the town ran by these Indians known as the Croatoans. And they're like, hmm, I wonder if that has something to do with where we're going. So they are like, all right, well, first, we're, let's go to the city. And they go and they head to the city where that moniker was. And they're like, y you learn that Olivia is here to find, like, a cure for her father. Like, she starts giving backstory to Hugh Jackman. She's like, my father's really sick. I really want to find the Fountain of Youth because I feel like it can help him get better. And then uh, Hugh Jackman is like, well, I'm just here to get rich, and I'm going to write a novel about this and just make so much money off of this. And during the trip, Russell Crowe is like, I'm just here to get paid. And his wife's like, I'm just here because he's here. And... Um, they don't find any clues at the city. They're searching. Uh, and they're, like, getting frustrated. And they keep, like... The Duke keeps going at it. Uh, Mel Gibson's character keeps going at it with Russell Crowe. Because Russell Crowe's like, Oh, you're a tough guy, huh? You're a tough guy on TV and in movies. He's like, uh, you know what, what a real tough guy does is he goes to war. And starts giving him shit because he's not a military man. But Hugh Jackman... Then it's like, well, you know that Croatoans are people too. Like, just because there's no clues here, maybe we maybe we can ask the people. So they go off to find the tribe. And they find the tribe, and they find the commander. And they're like, hey, can you tell us anything about the Fountain of Youth? Do you know where it is? What happened to the people of Roanoke? And he tells them, he's like, look, I, I can't help you, you know, I'm not able to. It's not in my place. And they're like, man, like, you'd really be helping us, like, any information you can give. And the, you know, chief's like, no, I'm sorry, like, I don't think you're worthy of, of the knowledge. And they start to leave, and Helen Bonacar just randomly shoots her gun in the air, and everyone freezes, and they're like, what the fuck? And she's, like, yelling at him. Russell Crowe walks up to the chief, and he's like, Look, you're either going to tell us the location, or I'll start skinning your children. And the chief's like, All right, I can tell you where it's at. Just don't hurt anyone. And he tells him it's in Florida. And Russell Crowe's like, All right, pulls out a map, rolls it out. It's like, Draw me the trail. Draw me the way to it. And the chief, you know... Tells them, look, it's called the Tamaimai Trail, and it leads to the Alligator Alley. Russell Crowe's like, all right, just for insurance, and he stabs the chief. And Mel Gibson goes to step forward and is, like, shocked. He's like, what the hell? Like, what? And he starts screaming at him, what are you doing? Russell Crowe turns around, just socks him in the face, and knocks him out. 
He wakes up. They're in canoes going through the Florida swamps. And you see Russell Crowe as the map. Helen and everybody, they're rowing him. It's just the standard group. And he he looks like slack jawed. He's just like, what the fuck? Like Hugh Jackman's like, what have I signed up for? Uh, Russell Crowe is just, you know, rowing and helping out. Olivia's like spaced out. And Helena's whistling and just having a blast and paddling. And Crow's humming along. And Mel Gibson then, like, starts arguing with Russell Crowe. He's like, what the fuck, man? Like, why did you kill him? Like, you had no reason to. He, like, he told us the location. And Russell Crowe, of course, it's back then. He's racist. He's like, you know, white, like, crying over red blood. And they're like, well, that's fucked up. Like, dude, come on, they're people. But they start rowing, and they approached where the map's leading to him. It's this giant tree, like a huge, huge, like, swamp tree that has a giant opening in the a mouth of it. And the mouth of the tree has writing all over it, and Hugh Jackman starts translating it. And uh, Crow's like, well, what, like, what's it say? And he's like, is it safe? And... He's like, yeah, it's safe. This is sacred tree. And they stand up, they tie the boats off, and they get in. And then they start walking around. And as they step in, like, they see areas, they light torches. And in there's four doors. Uh, One is on alligator. It has an alligator drawn on it. One has a snake drawn on it. One has a panther drawn on it. One has an eagle. And they're looking at it. And Hugh Hugh Jackman starts, like, reading the sigils all over the place. And he's like, this is a test. And they're like, the path, and he's like, the message is the path forward is on one of these doors. He's like, there's nothing else written. He's like, it's not a riddle. He's like, the words are just death, rebirth, death. And Crow just walks up to Hugh Jackman and says, pick a door and you know he's like why why me and Russell Crowe points his gun at him so Hugh Jackman approaches the eagle door and then he walks over to the pan- the uh, panther door and he looks at the alligator door and then he looks at the snake door he says the tribes here would most likely worship the panther and he pushes on the door, and the floor falls out and seals him. Crow uh, then smiles and says, next, and he points his gun at Olivia. And Mel Gibson stands up and is like, I'll, I'll choose. <coughs> and he goes up to the alligator door and looks at the snake door. And he's like, well, why doesn't she try this one, pointing at Helena? And... She laughs and says, in your dreams. And Mel Gibson, knowing some culture of the natives from past roles, sees the, the eagle and it's like, well, I remember eagles are, w- are one of the five spirit animals of the natives. So he goes up to the eagle door and closes his eyes and pushes on it and it opens. A bright light shines back through through the opening of the cave. It's, it seems to be like a shiny blue light in the water, uh, as if like an algae is growing in there, uh, like a lume- what are they called? Luminescent. Bioluminescence. Yeah. <clears throat> Olivia walks past him and goes up to the water, and Crow follows him and shoves him in there and tosses him a jug, and he says, "Can you fill that bottle?" He fills uh, one bottle. Olivia fills the other one. Olivia walks up to the door, goes out. As soon as uh, Mel approaches, Crow grabs the bottle and kicks him in the chest and pulls a gun out. And he says, uh, thanks, cowboy. And he closes the door. He pulls, like, uh, the whatever mechanism was in the door and pulls it, and it just drops on him. And Mel starts beating on the door and hears nothing. He looks looks around defeated, and on the walls uh, is written Crow Toen. 
and he touches it and the door opens right up he touches and and mel walks up and sees they're loading up the the kayaks and stuff and getting ready to paddle off crow pushes the kayak out a bit and gets ready to climb uh, onto it and just as he does he gets punched right in the side of the head and falls into the water and elena screams <clears throat> and reaches for crow when he resurfaces uh, he sees the bottle he was holding is is floating away, and then he sees the boat, and it's like a, you know he has to choose between them, and he he dives out for the bottle, and Helena screams in in looking at him because she sees an alligator rise in the swamp, and he sees it and he grabs the bottle and he's trying to swim as fast as he can to the boat, and Helena's holding her hands out. Well, Olivia steps up and and just pushes her right into the water with crow as he's reaching for his hands and when they both fall into the water the alligators swarm him and and do a death crawl and pull him under <clears throat> so mel gibson then gets into the boat and olivia thanks him is like oh my god you you saved my life like thank you so much and they have that one bottle and they're just paddling off and it's funny because as he's paddling he looks down and he sees the book that Hugh Jackman's been working on with all the notes and stuff. And he like laughs and just picks it up and takes it with him. So we cut to <clears throat> they're on a, a train. And he's sitting there reading the, the book that Hugh Jackman's been writing. And he's laughing because it ended with him writing what he thought was going to happen at the cave as they would approach the tree. And he found the fountain of youth and all this and just filled in his own stuff. He was like, man, I should... I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this published whenever we get back in, in honor of Hugh Jackman's character. And uh, Mel and Olivia are on a train just talking about how they're on their way back to see Gary Oldman's character. And she's like, yeah, I'm like so excited. They, they talk about what they want to do whenever they get back. And Mel Gibson's like, well, I want to settle down somewhere out west from it all. Maybe finish you know see if i can add more chapters to this book hugh's book and Olivia says she just wants to do some good in the world and cure her father and since they're on the train they're heading to california they go to bed mel wakes up with a note on his chest and um uh, it says dear john thank you for uh thank you for saving me and my father and i appreciate it there's a suitcase with $50,000. Please enjoy the West. My father and I want uh, nothing but to thank you for everything you've done. Uh, he loved your work and knew you could do it. You're a hero and a true gentleman. May the West give you what you deserve. And it just says, Diane Disney. And Mel Gibson laughs and realizes Gary Oldman this whole time was looking so familiar to him that it was a picture of Walt Disney <laughs> uh, at the like with the ledger and picture of Diane and um, for the title I don't know where I didn't know where to title this <clears throat> I was I was trying to think of like a way of having it about the fountain of youth but uh, I th I think it would just be you know the the journey for the fountain of youth like something generic you know. I I can't think of, I can't think of, like I can't make it about John Wayne like I can't be like the adventure of John Wayne or like I I think with this one it's yeah. got, it's got to be about what the journey was is to find the fountain of youth so it could be like I don't know you know there's no good fountain of youth titles uh, yeah talk everlasting youthful <laughs> juice no no yeah. <laughs> I guess like that's the one thing I struggled on. I couldn't think of a good title. But yeah. <laughs> it's just about Walt getting Walt Disney the cure for the fountain of youth and you don't know like that's the thing of that's funny is because like there's no real telling if it is like I mean he died in the end. So it's not like they found the actual fountain of youth. He was just trying everything he could. Yeah. That's where I was like, ah. Oh. An interesting twist on a very, very boring story. I'm sorry. No, I think it was good. 
that's, that's a lot of adventure in there. Your, your traditional like adventure with. I went for it with historical characters like John Wayne. Yeah. Uh, I figured it was funny because I was like, if Walt Disney saw John Wayne on TV, I was like, this motherfucker has done so much adventuring. He's perfect for this. Yeah. That was my logic. But yeah, it's about how uh, Walt Disney tried to get anything to prevent him from dying of cancer using his daughter. His real biological daughter, not his adopted daughter. I, I looked up. He had two daughters. I didn't know that, to be honest with you. I didn't either. I, was, uh, very I didn't even curious. know he had any kids, to be honest. Yeah, that's uh, that's this all started with me going like, do, uh, I wrote the story about Walt Disney, and I was like, wait, does he have a child? I was like, oh, he has two. He has an adopted daughter and a real biological daughter. And now only like 2% of Disney is owned by the Disney family. Which is just silly. So, That's still yeah. a lot of money, yeah. But yeah, that was my story. I'm sticking to it. I went all adventure with historical figures. Set yeah. in the correct time period. We had a lot Disney of different, uh, different ways of doing it, I, which is but we all fascinating. Great, yeah, we all had great ideas of like how do we incorporate historical events slash characters into a yeah. a story. That is an adventure. So, I don't know who do we think who do we think did the not the not best. This is the tough thing. Yeah. Like the criteria is: did they have enough of an adventure? Like, was there an actual adventure, or was there? Like, I feel like everybody had history. an adventure. But you know what I mean? Like that's the that's yeah. the hard part. Whose story would you see as a like a film? Like as a film in general. Well, that's Is where it, it gets weird because like you and I wrote a national treasure esque movie mm -hmm. where yeah. Adam wrote a fucking western. Which is still yeah. sick. Right, and that's that's what makes it tough as to what 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 to actually take and go through because everything I don't think the adventure part's the problem no I think neither, neither, adventure was the probably the easier part yeah. yeah but neither but the historical fiction hits every spot too really I mean yeah. it's like I went historical person you went historical like event like, yeah, thing. and then yeah. Elliot kind of picked like a historical myth with the fountain of youth yeah with historical figures I mean, you picked. Yeah. I mean, is John Wayne a historical figure though, or is he just like an actor? Uh, I would say he is like a historical figure. Like, do people like write about cowboy. him in history books? Yeah. Well, I would say like he's like you're like whenever you hear pop culture history for sure. Yeah, I guess like you know you think of like literally the when people think of a cowboy, like uh, like if you're thinking old western cowboy, you know you. John Wayne. I think of Clint like, Eastwood. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we do, but Clint, like, before Clint was John Wayne. Well, what's the gap between those two, really? It's actually pretty significant. Like, how much? So, I'm pretty sure John Wayne died in 68, 63. Let's, I mean. Din, 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 do, do, din, din, din. Dun, dun, dun. Wait, I shouldn't do that. I could get us. That might get us fine. No, it's okay. John Wayne, not Gacy. <laughs> we know what my phone looks yeah. like. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Uh, so he died in 1979. And uh, let's see. Clint Eastwood is. I know he's still alive. I can at least go that yeah. far. The man's still kicking. <laughs> So Clint Eastwood was born nineteen thirty. Still hella old. He yeah. is hella old. He's ninety one and he's still active. That's fucked up. So there is a significant like connection there where they both are old as fuck around the same times. And then I got Walt Disney. Very influential man, played played by Gary Oldman. <laughs> but 
No, I don't know. I I, I don't like this part. This is the this is the part where uh, like maybe we'll need impartial judgment. I think the only way to do it is without saying who did worse. I think it's going to go on a judgment of who is going to be the definitive winner first. Whose story are you voting for over the other person? I think that's going to have to be the first the first spot. It's so tough. Like, all right. So if you, uh, like we're saying like you get one, should we do it like you get one vote? Because like. Well, I'd you, say I'd say let's yeah like we each, like, let's each round we well, vote one. Well, well, I think the best way to do it is let's let's decide, like you decide who story you liked. Adam will do the same. I'll do the same. Whatever it is, whoever comes out the winner, will then pick second place. He'll decide which story he liked more out of those other two. Then, if I'm picking between yours and Adams, I like Adams more, only because I could. Like it, the beats were easier to follow overall from the adventure arc, you know what I mean? Where it starts with like people whose kids die, so they head out west, and then the other family they meet while traveling west, they clash like personalities on who should lead it, and then the adventure is just how that family adapts on its journey to its goal. Where the JFK one, I can't, I feel like I can't say. Who initially took the journey? Like, whose journey was it, main character-wise? Because by the end of it, you're between, is it Oswald? Is it JFK's journey we're following, or is it Oswald's journey to become who he becomes? That's me looking well, at it as a hard acting, like or like a hard storytelling aspect. Well, it's JFK's story overall. He just dies at the end, so yeah, Oswald yeah. has to be the it, victor. It, it's like The Departed, when you follow, you know the main character and by the end of it oh, so, the character dies. Oh, it's it's like a, I wrote an Oscar award winning movie. Weird. <laughs> he did. Weird. He did. But I don't know. Like I felt like for me <laughs> <laughs> Take the compliment of I you wrote an Oscar movie but I liked Adam some more. <laughs> I disagree with the Academy, I'm sorry. That was just me personally. I, I felt I, I felt like I followed Adam's story Full story arc easier versus yours in the sense of like movie wise. I don't know if that makes sense. Let's roll it from bottom to top, Adam. Go ahead. Um, I mean, I like them both a lot. There's a lot of good things about them. I'll just judge it based on which one I would see first, and it probably would have been Elliot's. I think it's just easier to follow. That. You know, it's just it'd be it would be the one that I would actually want to go and out to the movies and watch it instead of waiting until it comes to like HBO. <laughs> I would still watch them both. I still want to watch them both, but would I go to the movies to watch <laughs> the one about JFK? I don't know. So that's perfectly fine. This is where it's gonna suck because I already know I'm picking Adam's movie over Elliot's. So with that recommendation. I think I'm holding the L on this one. I know. Yeah. I didn't and want to do you. I'm sorry. And it's time to spin. It's time to spin the wheel. Yeah. All right. Let me dream this wheel. Set it I, up. I, I, I think will it's say, time dude, for it. I do think your movie is awesome. Like I do think it. I do think it legitimately is. I felt like it was more of a like toward toward the end of it. I was feeling like it was more of a series type of movie because of the long for the long con of format of seeing the relationship blossom over that length of time you know because it's jfk having an initial relationship with oswald then jfk's uh, initial relation with uh lyndon b and the downfall of, of all that it was it was nuts though that's kind of the one problem i had writing it in general because i was like there's no way to shortcut this no yeah, i don't I, know how yeah i could shortcut all of this shit with all these people but that also was one of the problems where I was like, man, six characters is a lot of fucking characters after fucking yeah. Yeah, horned in, dude. We, 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 we like, can we gotta cut it back to five. And, yeah, to five. Four or five. Four or five characters would yeah. be good. And I yeah. will say, you know what? I mean, of the ones to lose, David, the first one, that's fine. And it was exactly what you didn't want. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Literally exactly. Said, you called out <laughs> the hardest one for you, and fucking guess what? Babe Ruth pointed your finger <laughs> yeah. in the yeah. fucking... <laughs> And it God. fucking hit, and it was like the spin. It pissed me off too because it was so quick. It was like yeah. boom, adventure. I was like, stop, <laughs> stop yeah. it. Why, dude? So, 
So and then the worst one to go with it. Yeah. So now, <laughs> so now, so now, watch and review. Hot pepper, wet clothes, accents, fast, slow banana. That one's my uh, great winners. One. Purchase cinnamon. All right. So like, if I, if I'm gonna get one of these, that's gonna make shit easy on me. I kind of hope I either get the watch a shitty movie or the fast slow banana. <laughs> fast slow banana is my one of my favorite things on there. <laughs> I will say, I hope it's fast, slow <laughs> banana, or wet clothes. I mean, if it's any of the video ones, we have to get your camera set up. Uh, yeah. yeah. We have to. Yeah. The then, worst case, I'll film it separately, and then we'll just, we'll fucking shoehorn it in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, fuck. Okay. Let's see. All right. What does fate like the, decide? Like, the accent for, like, a whole thing's gonna fucking be annoying. I definitely don't want to be... But... I definitely yeah. don't want to be in wet clothes. I don't want to eat a fucking mouth, a, like a tablespoon of fucking cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And the hot list. pepper is all going to determine, because, like, I'll let you guys pick. If I get hot pepper, you guys pick what fucking pepper it is, then. Fair enough. I'll let you guys yeah. decide what pepper. But, yeah, if you want to spin it, I'm fucking, I'm ready. Spin it. Ladies and gentlemen, it is. <gasps> Oh, oh winner's, winner's purchase. <laughs> All right, Adam, which, which one is it going to be? I thought it was going to be fucking banana for a second. I was like, oh, I shit. thought it too. I was getting so I know, excited I for fast, so low banana. I was so ready for fast, low banana. Well, winner's purchase is still a great one where the winner's purchase something and the loser has to have it with them or on them or in at least the full episode shot. I think that one's great. Like, Yeah. Do you have something in mind already, or do you want to? Are you oh, gonna we'll wait? To, we'll... <laughs> is it gonna be a surprise? Like how? How do we want to work that? Oh man. Um, I think we. I don't have anything in mind right I now. Think, so I think we'll determine it during the week, and then yeah, we can. What we can do is we'll have the person take a photo with it. We'll post it on the Instagram and and the Facebook and everything, and then the episode will also feature it. I think that's the. Perfect yeah, for it, you know. I'm I'm down. I'm down. Well, then, now that we've gotten that set, are we we're spinning the wheel next episode for the next everything, I, like for the whole draft, or are we doing the wheel now and just the draft in the episode? Hmm. How are we? Yeah. How do you want to go about? But they were that? doing like Day and Dragons next, and yeah, then... we do have Day and Dragons next. So I think we'll do I think we'll do the same thing we did like we'll have yeah. Day and Dragons next week. Um, after that it'll be draft two baby and I think we spin the wheel. Do it all during you want to do it all during the draft? I think so. I think we do the same format. It, was, it felt like okay. a good a good hearty yeah. episode, and then again we'll see what fuckery we get. Yeah, and, and did we decide we're taking those off for this one so we can get. Adventure and historical fiction again, yep, right? Yep, we'll remove those and any actors God. that were picked. We yep. can't draft, and we'll we'll we can cycle that stuff back in. Yeah, yeah, we'll uh, do, a few times down the road. Yeah, I was gonna say we do at least like four drafts per season. I think that's pretty good. Yeah. And okay. Then okay. New season starts, but well, fuck, we made it, boys. Thanks again for your time. It was just another day with. David. Adam. Elliot. Like, comment, subscribe, click a bell. And you know what? Let us know which movie you liked. Or if you liked the draft, and uh, let me know what you want in Day and Dragons. I want to see what we can throw at these motherfuckers. I'll spit it right back in your face. <laughs> I'll take it. Glad Love you guys. Bye. Swallow it. <laughs> the show has ended. The show has